All right. Thank you all for joining us today on this special panel discussion at the World Economic Forum India Economic Summit. Without further ado, let me begin this conversation. And the topic of conversation today is reform, transform, and perform. Will what reforms do India need to power this economy to a $10 trillion dollar economy that can be both broad-based and inclusive? Uh, Mr. Godrej, maybe I'll start this conversation with you. We're talking at a time when the, the narrative of the India story, uh, given the macroeconomic indicators, have turned from being positive slightly to an area of doubt. What is your assessment of what's going on in the economy uh, and the reforms that have already been put in place? I think the doubt has started when we published the April-June GDP growth figure, which was at a low level of 5.7%. In my view, during April and May, we had reasonable growth. We don't publish monthly GDP growth figures. But in June, we had a rather low growth rate because that was a month preceding the introduction of GST. And in GST, in manufacturing items, there were lower rates than the earlier combination of excise duty and VAT. So obviously, there was considerable destocking by the trade, and there was considerably lower production shown. Production might have taken place, but it was not shown. Let me explain. In our case, one of our major items in our largest company called Goodrich Consumer Products is toilet soap. The GST rate on toilet soap is about 7 to 8% lower than the earlier combination of excise duty and VAT. We are also tight on capacity because demand has turned very good. So we couldn't stop production in June. We continued producing, but cleared the goods only in July because obviously if we had cleared it earlier, our tax costs would have been much higher. So obviously we showed much less production than we normally do. So I think that was the aberration. I expect a reasonably good growth rate in the July-September quarter, and I expect a good growth rate in the second half. Now, you mentioned what, in, what does India need to do. We must remember that post the liberalization of the economy in 1991, 25 years ago, a little more now, this has been the biggest single economic reform, GST. And it will add a lot of value to India's GDP growth rate. And we should wait a little and see. And I think people are being unnecessarily pessimistic. Already, if you look at the revenue collection under GST in July and August, the first two months of GST, both months have been well above one twelfth, or each month has been well above one twelfth of the earlier annual prediction. And there's still a lot of teething problems which are being gradually resolved. I think they'll get resolved soon. People will get used to it. We must also remember that this is the first time that anybody has put their major indirect tax system entirely on the internet. Collection is not based on paperwork. So I feel the economy is doing much better than is generally felt, and I think we'll see the results of that soon. Mr. Gautre, since you focus so much on GST, Radhika, come in on this. Uh, when you talk to smaller suppliers for your own business, what's the sense that we get? Because what we hear is that there are operational challenges and so on. What are you hearing on the ground? They have teething problems, uh, especially since everything is automated. Uh, they need good consultants. People have to appoint an outside chartered accountant to advise them, sure. which they weren't necessarily doing earlier. They're also getting used to it because some of the teething problems came for things which were the government gave time to file the returns, etc., etc. I think more teething problems will have to be attended to by the government. Sure. 
and one of the problems is if people were in businesses where they evaded taxes in the past that's over that will not be possible to do under gst okay radhika you want to come quickly i would completely agree with that mm. and uh, we work with about uh, 650000 small uh, medium micro small enterprises right these are small merchants traders who are being forced or literally uh, dragged kicking and screaming into the digital economy and into the taxed economy. Mm. And we saw exactly everything that uh, uh, Mr. Godridge mentioned about the GDP numbers. We saw it on a smaller scale at the grassroots, mm. where the first couple of weeks in June, people just took a step back. Our merchants took a step back. They did not want to participate in any kind of commercial activities mm. because they were just waiting and watching, trying to figure out you know, how GST is going to impact their business on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, we worked very closely with them. We worked with the government in providing them services that can get them GST numbers. What, mm. is, that, what is it that they need? And I have to tell you that uh, about 60% of all our merchants are GST enabled today. Mm. That number in itself might not sound very impressive, but it is far better than we had estimated it to be. Um, remember, you know, go back to the same statement that this is... Uh, a segment that was not in the taxed economy. So it the tax net is now not bigger. Much larger, much larger. Okay. The, the other aspect, and you heard the Prime Minister last evening uh, talk, I mean, making a fairly strong defense of the, the, the changes that have been made. Mr. Abhishek, if you look at the growth numbers, one aspect of the growth number, I mean, one reason people have, have been pointing out is the export slowdown. Uh, as government, what, what is the thinking of uh, ensuring that exports are back on track? Uh, seek your indulgence to take this debate slightly mm. away. We are only looking at the GDP numbers of 5.7, 6, 7, 7.5 and all that. But uh, why do we think that that is all the potential that India has? Why can't we do 9, 10, 11, 12? So if the GDP numbers are 7.6, everyone is happy. <laughs> so my, I would like to point out that what this government has been doing since last three years plus mm as uh, our Prime Minister has also pointed out several things, is to identify the major challenges to making our country competitive. You look at the infrastructure. We have a creaking infrastructure, inadequate infrastructure, the investments that are being made, project implementation that is being made. Look at the taxes. Direct tax, we have one of the highest rates in the world, mm. not competitive, but it is offset by huge amount number of exemptions. Now the government finance minister has made a road map to phase out the exemptions and bring down the corporate tax rate. Indirect tax, you have heard what yeah. a grim changing reform it is. Sure. Nobody had heard about the issue of concept of ease of doing business in this country, perhaps, before 2014. Today, we have made this a prime agenda of the government so that we bring down the cost of doing business in the country. Mm. You have a huge young population with demographic dividend, but where, is the, where are the skilled people? This uh, government has trained about 12 million people in the last three years. Mm. So all these things combined, startups, as a matter of fact, they are making our com economy more competitive. Our cost of logistics is 14% of GDP. It is 7% in China. How do you expect to compete? Your R&D spend is less than 1%. Mm. Where is the innovation? I think all these things have to be looked at together. GDP numbers, as uh, Mr. Godres has correctly pointed out, one quarter, two quarter, or one year is one thing. Mm. But if you look at slightly uh, you know, bigger view, 30,000 feet view, then you will see that the changes that are required in this country are being actually done and addressed. You want to but do you really expect that all these things will happen in one year, two years? It will not. Okay. Uh, sp any specific point you want to make on exports? See, so far the exports are concerned. Mm. The government made this uh, the, you know, provision in GST that they have to pay duties in the beginning on all the imports or raw materials in inputs. And after they manufacture and export, they can get credit. Mm. Now suddenly the exporters were stuck with a uh, working capital requirement. This issue was known. This was flagged to the GST Council, but at that time they took a view that, you know, let them pay and then we'll try to expedite the refund. Now the issues have come up again and the government is looking at it. But, you know, making exports competitive also is the same issue. The GST is actually reducing the cost of transportation by 30% already in a, such a short time. Sure. So all the check posts are gone. You ask those uh, hundreds of thousands of truck drivers, you know, how they were stopping everywhere and paying bribes in every check post. See, the kind of changes that are being made are so fundamental. Then let's not, uh, I will recommend not to worry about one or two quarter numbers. Okay. 
Ms. Honda, as, as an outsider looking at the India story, uh, you know, what are investors telling you? As somebody who looks at investments into this part of the world, uh, what to your mind are key priorities for India? You know, many people say that governance framework of India is resistant to change. Are you seeing that changing? Well, first of all, I think investors having a middle to longer term view. Investors not necessarily looking month by month GDP growth, quarter by quarter. When we look at the demographics of India, I have to tell you, most of the ministers of finance of the rest of the world, they must be thinking they were the minister of finance of this country. Mm. So that's fine. Demographics is the one determining economic growth. And in demographics, the one, it's very difficult to change quickly. I'm originally from Japan. Demographics is tough. Mm. India is the completely opposite part. That gives a definitely the reasons a lot of close border private investors to look at India. At the same time, also I have to tell you one, one thing. I think there are a lot of things to be done in this country. For example, India has 300 million people living without access to the power. And uh, over 70 million people living without access to the clean water. Mm. This is opportunity for the private investors. At the same time, this is the area India can improve, then they can attract more private investors. Mr. Godrej, you run a large conglomerate across multiple sectors. Uh, this point about ease of doing business, has that you know, tangibly changed in the last couple of years? Let's put it this way. Mm. Ease of doing business has been very poor in India, mm. historically. It comes from our socialist Mindset. days. Yeah. In 91, we made some improvements, and that improved ease of doing business. Mm. I think this government has also taken many steps which have improved the ease of doing business. But I would still feel that the ease of doing business in India needs much further improvement. Mm. And we should keep taking steps. Unfortunately, we have an attitude and a mentality that government needs to interfere in things for things to improve. It is not only a government mentality. I think it's general populace who has that mentality. We must get over it. And whenever, if you look at the performance of the private sector in most items, it does better than when government handles it. And this disinvestment mm. and privatization, I think, will go a long way. The last NDA government privatized quite a few enterprises, which are doing very well today. And we should similarly look at that. It gets revenue now for the government, and it gets better performance in the future. So there's a lot of opportunity to leverage that thinking. So Abhishek, you know, when we talk about reforms, reforms have been synonymous with basically fixing you know, red tape or fixing legacy issues. That's what reforms have been so far, uh, barring what we've seen with GST and so on. Uh, do you think government is open to changing the way government functions? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I, I couldn't agree more with Mr. Godrej. Mm. See, today, in this year, all the FDI that has come, 97% mm. of that has come under the automatic route, without need for any approval. Mm. You look at the date, historical data, so the complete change in mindset also. We are doing ranking of states on ease of doing business. We are asking them, and they are implementing, actually, that why do you need approval at all? Can we just inform and that's it? Or if you don't get approval in certain time, 30 days and all that, it is deemed to be approved. Mm. So technology-driven governance, completely removing the personal interface between the citizens and the government authorities or the municipal authorities, time-bound approvals, deemed mm. approvals, all these things are being advocated. Risk-based inspections, risk-based approvals. Earlier, 100% of the consignments, import consignments were inspected by the customs people and the various agencies, depending on their product. Today, only 10% are being inspected, which is the global risk management norm. Mm. Can you imagine 100% to 10%? This is the change in mindset. 
you know, hardly any direct port delivery was being given in this country at all. Mm. Now, in last one year, it has gone up to 30% in the Jawaharlal Nehru Port Trust. 30%. We want them to take it to 70%. So, the ease of doing business work, the mindset change has started. It's going to take time. But, you know, the initial period has been the toughest. Okay. Radhika, you want to come in on the ease of doing yeah. business? Over here, and, and uh, I heard Mr. Goldridge's point of view on you know how things have changed from '91. But I can tell you that we've been in business in this country for the last six years. After living in the U.S. for about 15 years, we came back, and things have changed. And uh, especially when you look at the consumer internet or the startup ecosystem, there is. And we work closely with Mr. Abhishek on this. The change has been that of day and night, literally. When we started the company in uh, 2011, it took us about three months to get approval to just, just get the company off the ground. Now that is done in less than a day. If you're starting doing a startup here, a technology startup, it's less than a day. And uh, why are we just looking at economic reforms, right? Let's look at social reforms, triple, tel triple talaq, that's gone away. Let's look at reforms that are happening on the infrastructure uh, basis as well, Jandhan. Jam, you know, it is. It's changed the way our consumer and and uh, these are the grassroots consumers. These are the consumers, the mass consumers that are there. They are they are interacting with us. It's changed the way they are interacting with the government itself. Mm -hmm. And now, just lay, take a thirty thousand view. Um, the first time ever, the government has actually taken a step back and had what they call a startup initiative. Right, mm -hmm. startup India, stand up India. Initiatives where they are ready to talk to entrepreneurs like me, talk to other entrepreneurs who are trying to do something different, who are trying to disrupt the way uh, business is done in India. Mm. The Prime Minister actually spent more than a week with us in uh, this program called the Champions of Change, where uh, uh, there were 200 of us, uh, it, um, you know, the new economy or, or uh, the um, uh, technology startup entrepreneurs, where we just brainstormed on the ideas about how we can make policy changes in India, mm. whether that is around health, whether that is around travel tourism. Um, nothing has come out of it as yet, but this has just happened. Mm. And it's happened for the first time. So going back to the attitude being right, to the mindset being right, we are definitely starting on the right foot. Okay. Can we expect changes to happen overnight? No. For reform to get to transform, there is going to be a time period. We should look at a 2030 time period instead of looking at it, you know, how much change has happened this quarter, next quarter. It's not going to happen overnight. It is going to be an up and down cycle. But we are all headed in the right direction, which is much more than we've been so far. Okay. Very point. optimistic That's about that. That's an optimistic that. point to make. Keiko, uh, Radhika referred to infrastructure, and one of the objectives that you look at is bridging infrastructure investment gaps. Uh, and we have a large gap here in India. Uh, do you see, I mean, and some of the transformative ideas need to come in, 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 in the area of infrastructure. Uh, would you look at funding something here in India? Is there something that interests you? Uh, what is your assessment of the gap that is here? Okay, well, and some people, not only necessarily in India, but like some people think what's missing is the financing. So therefore, those people kind of asking us, can you widening or bring different types of investors such as pension fund or insurance company? However, I have a different view. I think what's missing is not a financing. What's missing is the investable project. What I'm kind of recommending, not only India, but all other Middle-income country have a right future. To government development of financial institutions like us and private investors to work together to identify potential projects that we can work together, especially like identify the project to leverage private investors to invest in. Not necessarily using a lot of balance sheet of the government itself. Ms. Gautrej, her point is that capital is not the problem. There needs to be investable projects. Uh, you want to come in on that? Yeah. Aren't we seeing a problem of capital as well in, in, in India? Well, it depends on how you look at it. Hmm. Uh, there was a period where people in business became very optimistic and <clears throat> invested a lot of money and invested a lot of borrowed funds. 
I think we should always keep an eye on the ratio between borrowed fund and equity fund. Mm. It's a common lesson learned globally over the years and not rely excessively in good times on borrowed funds. Today we are seeing tremendous appreciation of that in terms of large collections of large amounts of IPOs being transacted. Equity is rising and that's the way to finance the future. And I agree that we should have investments in projects not necessarily rely on the government because there's a limit to what the government can do if the fiscal balance mm. has to be maintained. But I think if we follow some of these fundamental guidelines, I think we can do extremely well in the future. Mr. Abhishek, I want to focus on another point and, and the topic of this conversation really is about how can we make reforms that's broad-based and inclusive. Uh, and we are living in one of the most unequal societies in the world. And reforms tend to benefit already those who have benefited. Uh, and I want to specifically point about agriculture. And, and the case that's before us is agriculture as a, as, a, as a job, as a profession, is becoming unviable, unproductive. Incomes are not growing. Uh, how does one you know, create reforms there? Agriculture is one of the most important priorities for the government because Still, we have a majority of our population living off agriculture. See, there are so many challenges in agriculture. One was the dependence on monsoons mm. and the risks associated with any uh, crop. The crop insurance scheme, which have been brought in by the government, gives much better coverage in terms of uh, risks. And a lot of people are availing of it. One of the challenges of uh, agriculture is marketing. Because if, you, if the producer, farmer doesn't get a good price, obviously, you know, there's no incentive to produce. Mm. Now, this you know, electronic national e-market that is being set in motion in about 600 mandis of the country, actually, Karnataka is the pioneer in this regard, I think will actually give the farmers a better price. But then the state government has a major role in agriculture. Mm. The, remember that central government has a limited role in many fact areas, including agriculture. Mm. The, you, you know, perhaps the farmer is only... Uh, person in the country who needs a permission to or who has a restriction to sell his produce. Mm. I mean, nobody else has that restriction. He can't uh, sell it to somebody who comes to his house or his field. He has to go to this particular market. There are so many restrictions. He, you cannot do contract farming. So the kind of restrictions that have been put on farmers need to be removed by the states. Mm. Central government has been recommending it and advocating it for a long time. Mm. We need to improve the marketing. So I think uh, agriculture, a lot of initiatives are being taken. Doubling the farmer's income by 2022 is one of the major goals. Government has spent huge amount of money in the last two years on completing the pending irrigation projects mm. because we need to improve the irrigation part of it. As a matter of fact, in procurement, to give a better price, for the first time, government procured 2 million tons of pulses because the pulses production went up and all that. So a lot of interventions are being done. But the agriculture is definitely the most important area. And I would say, from my own experience of uh, regulating futures market earlier, is that the marketing is the key and that the state governments have a major role in that. Sure, sure. That, sure. That I'm talking about agriculture, uh, this government initiative to double the income of the agriculturists in five years is a very good initiative. But besides agriculture, we need to pay a lot of attention to animal husbandry. Hmm. Not just dairy, but poultry, fisheries, Prawn, for example, animal husbandry can add a lot of income to agricultural families. And animal husbandry promotion tends to include a lot of females in the household into the economy. It will add a lot of value to the economy. Mm. And I think if we concentrate on that, we will do a good job in our country. Okay. I, I want to turn this focus of this conversation to something related. Uh, agriculture being one of the largest employers and the key question of jobs. Uh, if we have to bring in inclusive growth, it really boils down to can we create more jobs? Uh, there is no comprehensive data in this country telling us what the unemployment numbers are, which is primarily the problem. Uh, what should government be doing? Uh, and then we can go to the private sector. <clears throat> the creation of jobs, of course, yes. is the most important thing. Now, uh, the jobs, it could be also self-employment opportunities. Yes. It need not be that you know someone Somebody is working for a salary. Yeah. 
तो गवर्नमेंट हैज पॉलिसी ऑफ लुकिंग एट बोथ कि नाउ मोस्ट ऑफ द जॉब्स आर एक्चुअली गेटिंग क्रिएटेड इन द सर्विसेज सेक्टर बिकॉज इन मैन्युफैक्चरिंग दर इज ए लिमिट टू आइर यू ऑटोमेट आइर यू इंट्रोड्यूस टेक्नोलॉजी सो मोस्ट ऑफ द आवर इंटरवेंशन आर कैपिटल इंटेंसिव एक्सेप्ट इन सम सेक्टर्स लाइक टेक्सटाइल्स एंड लेदर फुटवेयर जेम्स एंड ज्वेलरी विच आर स्टिल लेबर इंटेंसिव इंडस्ट्रीज बट देयर वी ऑल्सो नीड टू हैव इन अ बेटर एफ टी एस टू गेट बेटर मार्केट फॉर आवर प्रोडक्ट्स सो आई थिंक मोस्ट ऑफ द जॉब्स गेट क्रिएटेड इन सर्विसेज सेक्टर एंड सिंस वी डोंट हैव अ वेरी गुड काउंट ऑफ Look at the opportunities and the jobs being created by e-commerce. There are companies which are creating hundreds and thousands of jobs. Each of them, if Radhika is sourcing these uh, products in from on her platform from hundred thousand uh, you know, small producers and traders, look at the kind of job creation that is taking place. Mm. And in job creation, as I said, please include the income generating opportunities. Mm. Look at the Mudra and Stand Up India program. You have got you know uh, crores of people have got loan and funding. Mm. I think uh, we really need to look at job profiles differently. not just the kind of jobs that are created in a particular manufacturing sector or services sector basically we need income generating opportunities either by way of self employment or by way of a salaried employment radhika you want to come in on this and explain to us some of the experience that you have so um you know pretty much on the cusp of what mr goldrej and mr abhishek said is that uh, you know about 45% of the population of our country is women and to be able to bring them into the organized economy to bring them into the job sector has been a huge challenge and it's something that i feel very personally very strongly about and uh, through e-commerce as well just the you know we work with facebook very closely and and a lot of the private sector companies have come in in a big way to provide skill development to these uh, to women that are sitting in rural india to women that are sitting in urban areas that have not had exposure to the job market where they can come in and work from home opportunities as well and um, i think very similar to what mr abhishek said right uh, 600000 merchants on the platform each merchant has about 5 employees who work with them if they are selling offline the minute they start selling online they add about 2 to 3 more employees those are significant amount of jobs that are created just by someone who caters to about 10% 10 to 12% of the unit shipment in the entire e-commerce space mm. so as the digital economy becomes more pervasive job growth goes up and this is just uh, and and this is just the trade sector that i'm talking about i'm not talking about manufacturing as yet which in itself has taken on a different growth mm. so um i think with all the uh, uh, the startup india stand up india uh, you know we are on the cusp of that we work uh, and and the skill development program uh, we are seeing jobs grow pretty rapidly uh, unfortunately for us it's the same thing we don't know what is the right number to look at to see what our contribution to the economy has been and we can talk about that and we can move forward on that so it's lack of data or metrics uh, more than anything else sure. but um, on the grassroots level uh, there have been changes for sure uh, so on specifically about jobless growth and this is not an india specific ph- phenomenon is it jobless growth i you know we are actually observing several different country also at the same time i think there is not only one path to create more jobs historically agricultural created a lot of job then a second manufacturing created a lot of jobs now as uh, mr secretary we just mentioned service industry creating a lot of jobs but going forward there may be some other disruptive technologies with disruptive service model may create jobs and then india may be very well positioned because of the the current demographics language proficiencies and also the positioning in terms of the you know, geopolitical positioning at the same time if i may can yeah, so suggest one thing to the india now i'm very 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 glad to learn yesterday today indian government is welcoming more foreign direct investment mm. some of the foreign direct investors who actually have a cutting edge technology cutting edge business model are looking at opportunity in india can we consider to leverage them to create different types of job here and in different types of vocational training to have them in here you sure sure we're talking about the various opportunities you know we have uh, been uh, trying to promote japanese investments in india there are only 20000 japanese language knowing people in india <laughs> and we have 
you know, 26 odd, uh, billion dollars of Japanese investment. You know how many Japanese uh, knowing people are there in China? 20 million. And no wonder they have 300 billion dollars plus FDI from Japan in China. See, we have not focused on these areas. Now we are doing that now. So look at the kind of job opportunities there in just knowing the languages of these countries. We are trying now to have more language training for Japanese, Chinese, for Korean and languages where we are actually getting a lot of investment and we can get much more, mm. just one area. But then these things have been neglected over decades. Mm. So, but I think uh, now that we have started our attention on that, uh, many of these opportunities will be created. Mr. Godre, uh, coming back to the point about jobs, what can private sector do? No, a lot of things. Mm. For example, one side we say that there are people who are unable to get jobs. Mm. On the other side, we say there are a lot of job opportunities which are going unfilled. Mm. For example, we have an acute shortage in the health and education sectors of people. Now there's a new scheme being introduced of having school teachers being trained without necessarily getting a bachelor of teaching degree. Mm. That can add a lot of value. We need more teachers. We need more health workers, etc. So we should match people's skills with the needs. Mm. And I like to sometimes say there is no unemployment in India, only unemployability. Mm. There are many sectors where we can't get people. And we've got to work hard to see that they match. For example, with the corporate social responsibility program started, a lot of people are training a lot of people, which helps their own businesses. We are, for example, in our group, training housewives to start hair salons in their homes. Mm. We, have a, we are leaders in the hair color business in India. It's helping our business. It's creating a lot of employment, self-employment, women employment. So there are lots of ways to push this, but we must work hard at doing what is needed. Okay. My last lot of question before I throw it out to the audience, uh, Mr. Abhishek, uh, GST is done. From a structural reform standpoint, what next? I think this uh, mindset change is very critical. Mm. A lot of mindset change has taken place in the last three years. Since my department, we work very closely with all ministries, departments, and states in improving ease of doing business, investing uh, investment promotion, and so on, I think we really need to carry it forward much more. Mm. Because that is where a lot of things get stuck. A lot of people ask us, you know, and we deal with hundreds and hundreds of such things every week, every month, that things are getting stuck in so many places. I think it's going to take some time, but uh, we are on the job. But uh, uh, all the things that have been started, see that this government is very uh, flexible and responsive. It doesn't claim that it knows all the solutions. It doesn't say that it has all the answers. That's why we keep talking to stakeholders and checking with them what should be done. You want to improve chemical sector, you want to improve the retail sector, what should be done? And then the government is very proactive in taking those decisions. I think this responsiveness of the government, sensitivity, and <coughs> this uh, determination that we need to create a new India where the mindset change is the really the precondition. So I think all these things, we'll take it forward on startups, I personally have had at least 100 meetings with the startups and the ecosystem partners in last one year. Just to understand, we fight for them, we fight for the investors with other departments, whether it's e-pharmacy or any other issue, that why are you having this regulation on mobility, on any, any issue. Sure. So I think this work has to go on and this mindset change has to percolate down to every level. Radhika, what things would you like to see in India? Uh, one thing that has got a lot of negative press, but I think it's going to be a game changer um, going forward and, and so far as well, is the uh, cashless economy. UPI, I feel it's not got its um, mm. share. It's not got its due. It's going to change the way business is done. I think uh, financial inclusion, economic inclusion, mm. uh, all of that, when you look at uh, the rural economy and, and their uh, participation into everything that we are doing in the urban areas is going to be phenomenal. I'm very, very excited about that, and I think that's going to change things uh, significantly. Mr. Godwin? Yeah, whilst I agree on this cashless economy, uh, or the movement towards that, helping in a lot of sectors, we have to be careful of one thing. We sometimes forget that cash as a mode of payment 
is the only thing which is free. Everything else costs money. All over the world, cash is subsidized by governments. And we learnt it the hard way during the demonetization period when wholesalers who do a lot of sales between our distributors and the millions of retailers in India were had difficulty because of non-availability of cash. I was myself surprised to find out that the gross margin of our wholesalers is one and a half percent, gross margin. Mm. Any mode of payment other than cash Wipes doesn't out. work for them. Mm. Not to evade taxes, but from a cost point of view. Mm. Now we have to bear in mind, if we can find other modes of payment where like cash is subsidized by government, then it could be very easily adopted for such activity. And hopefully UPI will, should yeah. solve okay. that. If, if we just push that point a little further, other than the cash economy, of course, uh, would you say labor is an area that, that requires reform? Yes, mm. I think so. And not, it requires reform because we sometimes forget and we, we talk of robotics and etc. and artificial intelligence and feel that it will affect us negatively. All growth in the world has come from productivity increases. Mm. So we should welcome productivity increases. Mm -hmm. Only thing is we should adjust to the productivity increases and see that the growth added takes care of the jobs that might get displaced. So yes, I feel we should be positive and work towards strong development in these areas. We get too negative sometimes about global developments and about the trend. Okay, let me get a little negative now. Uh, uh, Keiko, yes. risks. You look at risk profile of, 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 of countries across the world. If you look at India, what to your mind are risks to the story? On, well, India is not a high-risk country mm. among the countries that are we, we serve. That's why I have to say that. But at, at the same time, if, you, if India wants to optimize the potential, realize the potential, of course, there is some room to improve. For example, if you really want to enhance this infrastructure, Government cannot really be responsible for building every single power stations, every single road, every single bridges. And you probably want to, up to leverage some private, including foreign private investors. Sure. Then those foreign private investors have perceived risk. For example, if they really need to go into like a long term, such as 15 to 20 years of power purchase agreement with the, some of the SOE of the government. They have to kind of think about potential like breach of contract by governments. I'm not really saying one central government, maybe regional government, or maybe SOE. I think those risks, what I'm recommending to the private investor is slice the risk and then find a way to mitigate the risk. For example, one thing, I'm so I'm so sorry, I have to kind of also introduce MIGA. MIGA provide credit enhancement for the government. At the same time, MIGA also provide potential breach of the governments. If it's perceived risk, we cover, then they are willing to come on. Mr. Bishik, risks to, to the story? Yeah, I said, uh, you look at the macroeconomic fundamentals, mm. so which are very strong. You look at the reform story, which is very robust and is gaining strength. And look at the audacity of the government to do reforms. Mm. No government, perhaps, would have dared to bring down the rate of savings, GPF, PPF, and all that. But how do you bring the cost of capital in the country if you don't bring down those rates? This government actually took the bull by the horn mm. and did that. Demonetization. People may have uh, different uh, uh, versions and uh, stories, but the fact is that no one can question the audacity of that reform. Mm. And similarly, GST. The government could have taken the easier option, you know, I mean, life was going on. And why have all these conversations and bad press? But the government has taken that risk. Mm. So here, actually, all the risks in this country are being taken by the government today. OK. On that note, I'll throw it open to the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Introduce yourself, and I'll send a mic across to you. Uh, I'll come to the gentleman in the third row. Can we pass a mic here, please? Yeah. Uh, if you can stand up and 
introduce Thank you, yourself. Rajiv, PCCW. Sure. My question is to Ramesh and Radhika, mm. and it pertains to broadband and what reforms can we do to bring broadband to the households, right? I think Adi mentioned that this is the first tax. GST is the first tax when everything is on the internet. And Radhika's entire business model is predicated on the internet being available to every household in the country. And we are in trouble there. Last one year has been good on the telecom side, but telecom is now going into serious red waters, and uh, investment has pretty much stopped, except for one player. Right? On fixed line, we've got an atrocious story to tell in India. You know, maybe 20 million connections, most of it in 512 KB peers, and government sector connections, really. Right? What can be done? You know, unless we get this internet to all the households, 280 million households across the country, we can't just sit in Bombay's and Delhi's and 50 cities in India and just assume that India is going to be these 50 cities, right? 9,000 right. cities and 6 lakh villages. How are we going to do it? Sure. You want to take that? Okay. See, if uh, you look at the optical fiber network under the uh, broad, uh, extending the broadband in the country, less than 100 kilometers of optical fiber network was laid when this government came to power. Today, we have actually connected more than 100,000 gram panchayats in the country with broadband network. This is the kind of work that has happened in the last one and a half to two years in extending the optical fiber network. Now, what is being done in the second phase is to connect the rest 150,000 panchayats. And the various states have various models. So now we have a flexible model. You want to go underground, overground, optical fiber network, VSAT. All, all models, Wi-Fi, everything is being done. And the government of India is actually supporting the states in doing it. For us, it's very important that our digital infrastructure is key to our economy and all the growth that we are looking at. So I think uh, the, you see the amount of work that has been done on extending optical fiber network is quite staggering, actually. I, mean, uh, I just want to add to that that, uh, yes, the last year has been uh, fabulous for us, honestly, with Geo bringing in so many new consumers especially from tier three, tier four. Of course, sustainability doesn't look too bright right now. But I think uh, uh, the extension of uh, broadband is going to be through a partnership of government and private. Uh, I don't know if you know, but about 7% of internet consumption is through Indian railways right now, where Google has worked and has partnered with the government and provided free Wi-Fi. So I think a lot of those partnerships will be needed, uh, and uh, significant uh, inroads will have to be made on that. We were very excited when uh, the budget talked about BharatNet and uh, the extension. Uh, it's again one of those things that you cannot expect an overnight change, but we are seeing change uh, in uh, tier three, tier four right now. Yes, sir. Can we pass the mic here, please, the first row? I'm Ratul Puri from Hindustan Power. Uh, first, I'd like to just uh, uh, concur with the panel that I think the reforms that the government has undertaken truly are transformative. I think I, we, we, I'm in a business that engages a lot with the government, and we, are, we truly are seeing a government that is engaging, willing to listen, uh, be proactive, and, and make change. One of the discussions in the last, uh, uh, some of the discussions in the last two days of the forum have been around the fourth IR and the impact of the fourth IR, I think, on, on, on the world and on India. And one of the fears I have are, is that, you know, this essentially creates, could potentially create a huge opportunity for India, but also could create a challenge. Mm. In as much as a lot of the jobs that traditionally China and many other economies uh, created uh, at the bottom end of the pyramid may not exist in the future. How are we going to potentially deal with this? Because the fourth IR is real, it's here, and it's happening faster than we think. You want to go? Oh, okay. Oh, the tough <laughs> <laughs> we are uh, used to facing the challenges head on, so it's okay. See, the fourth industrial revolution is something that will also <coughs> open up great opportunities for us. We have a very smart, innovative young population. Our, uh, they are really doing enormous amount of work on uh, IoT. That's what you are talking about, right? IoT, robotics, on uh, additive printing, and so on. Uh, we are now coming up with a policy in uh, consultation with the stakeholders on how we can actually take advantage and do a transition to Industry 4.0 and smart manufacturing. See, the uh, profile of jobs being created in the country and in any economy is completely changing now. While you may have some robots coming into manufacturing, which in India will take much longer than it is taking in China or Japan or somewhere. But then the kind of efficiencies they bring in, Mr. Godrej talked about productivity. That will actually create jobs in other sectors. Mm -hmm. See, one of the job creating sectors is going to be logistics. And in this whole, after GST particularly, 
in retail, I think there are tremendous opportunities of job creation in retail and logistics today. But that requires an efficient and competitive production of goods and services in the country. And that is where all these data, big data analytics, all IoT or, uh, and 3D printing, artificial intelligence is going to make a big difference. And I can see that with a, uh, a strong MSME sector, if we take the, do the right policies, we do the right promotion, actually is going to be a game changer for us and for our small businesses and industry as well. But we need skilling. We need reskilling of people. That, as Mr. Godre said, we have so many people and we have so many demands of the economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, but you have to match them. So the skilling is very critical if you really want to uh, take full advantage of Industry 4.0. You want to add, Mr. Godre? I go yeah. to the next question. So I'll, I'll just give you one example. This fourth industrial revolution will help India in many forms, as Secretary just mentioned. But let me tell you what happens. Incomes rise in certain sectors as a result. And I'd like to give you what can happen to create jobs just in the fast-moving consumer goods sector. There are only three package branded items that are fully penetrated in India. That means every family uses soaps, detergents, and matchsticks. Everything else is underpenetrated. Even things like toothpaste and shampoo are underpenetrated. As incomes rise, people start consuming much more of these goods, which then require a lot of people. In manufacturing, yes, considerable people. But as mentioned, in distribution, in logistics, the number of jobs added is tremendous. And that can add significantly to the economy. We shouldn't forget the positive effects it can have in other sectors. I've just given you one example. Yes, sir. You're right. Hello, I'm Rishi Chavla from Philips Lighting India Limited. I represent the LED lighting uh, sure. segment. Uh, LED lighting is one of the focused vertical uh, of the government of India, and Make in India has seen a lot of results, Make in India story, in the LED sector. The manufacturing has grown in the LED sector, and there is a lot of consumption or a lot of demand, like we've uh, heard from uh, Minister Piyush Goyal as well in the previous session. But I want to raise a risk here, sir. Uh, we've seen, we've noticed 60% uh, of the LED products that are available in the market are illegal. They should not be allowed to be sold. They are not contributing to the taxes, to the duties. They are not contributing to make an India story to, in any form to the economy. That's happening only in cash. Sorry, when you mean illegal? When I mean, when I say illegal, they do not have a uh, manufacturer's name and a manufacturer's address. So once you don't have a manufacturer name or address, that means you are not contributing to any of the taxes. They're, they're not into the system, but they are being openly sold in the market. Now, the risk is of law enforcement. Are these imported also? Are these imported also, some of these? Uh, these are imported as well as manufactured, but because of some regulations, the, uh, the finished, see LED manufacturing or LED assembling is very easy. So components are being imported, and these are being assembled in households, in sheds, as illegal manufacturing, and being sold without any brand, or maybe fictitious brands in the market. And this is a AC Nielsen report I'm citing. So this report has been done by the lighting segment, and we can present to you uh, whenever we meet in the future. Correct. Sure. Okay. I'm glad we have done something in this area, so I have something to say. <laughs> See, I'll just take you to the broader question of having quality control orders or technical regulations. In European Union, there are 1,500 quality control orders on various products. In India, we have 150. We have another area of major neglect has been issue of technical regulations in our country. So you can neither check whether the quality is uh, there in the imported product or in the domestically manufactured product. We have started this work on a war footing that having quality control orders for almost every product that we are consumed in the country. And this work has picked up on LED lighting. 
see there again uh, there is there has been some issue of which ministry deals with it my department ministry of electronics ministry of power we have sorted it out the quality control orders under the uh, bis act or the compulsory registration order are being issued now that will take care of the any imported stuff of poor quality which doesn't meet the standards and we are also going to set up this conformity assessment procedures on domestic manufacturing which is done see the gst is going to issue these questions at fully that's why it's very disruptive earlier there was no nobody was tracking people could buy stuff which was not tax paid mm -hmm. now nobody can buy stuff which is not tax paid because they will have to pay the tax themselves so there are a lot of mechanisms in gst as mr godres pointed out is very difficult to evade taxes under the gst regime i am sure our some of the engineers people may still try to find out <laughs> but it's going to get more and more difficult as the time passes because the use of cash the direct tax regime the gst regime all combined and the kind of it database that is being created is going to make it very difficult for this kind of uh, illegal manufacturing so you should fully support gst i really appreciate mm -hmm. the phenomenal growth during the time of monetization sure and also when the gst got implemented in july but the ingenious ways of these traders or these people they come back again and with greater force i don't know how Credit Indian ingenuity for that. Uh, I have time for one last question. The lady there. Thank you so much. I'm Nisha Agarwal with Oxfam India. You talked about the rising inequality in India. Whether you look at income, we are second only to Brazil or South Africa, or wealth, we are second only to Russia. So when you ask that question, what is the next set of reforms needed to get a more inclusive India? Uh, I'm not sure I heard about reforms. Is it tax reforms there's an article in the economic times on in inheritance taxes being introduced is it public expenditure reforms is it labor market reform w what needs to be done because the we we are really now at number 2 and we are going to soon be at number 1 if we don't look at the inequality issues really as part of part of the major problems that we are facing you want to go well uh, it's uh, it's uh, very good to go for Uh, growth which is inclusive but i don't think inclusive growth means we should look only at the ratio of highest incomes to lowest incomes or only to the ratio of highest wealth to lowest wealth we should look to is the lowest wealth increasing sufficiently is the lowest income increasing sufficiently free enterprise based growth which is the best known growth system in the world people have tried a lot of other things like communism etc etc and rejected them does mean that the more capable people will tend to do better but what is most important to bear in mind is are the bottom layer increasing their wealth or income strongly for example the statistic in india is that below poverty level population has come down very considerably which is to my mind a good thing so i think economically we should study what are the important markers just in communism perhaps these ratios you talk about might have been best but there was no growth so what's the use of having good ratios without growth we must have high growth and then the best possible ratio okay, cool. sorry you want to come in on that uh, no this is okay, okay. Ramesh, i think reducing inequality is one of the most important uh, duty of any government absolutely but while reducing inequality is important we also should look at the per capita income of the people below you know at that uh, lower uh, rung of society in terms of income i think 80% of our people work in the msme sector contributing to 20% of that value of the output so there is a tremendous underemployment in the among the 80 to 90% people in the country in china 70% people work in msme sector contributing to 80% of the value of the output so you can see how the income distribution is different i think if we want to improve the incomes of our people and inequality is of course one part of it we really need to do the skilling if we don't have skills if we don't improve the quality of education no one is going to get a higher income we don't want, we have an army of unskilled people who are mm. not suited to so many jobs so i think that is one uh, important area second 
uh, some one of the major interventions of the government in terms of direct benefit to the poor has been uh, direct bank transfer through the use of Aadhaar and you know bank accounts and all that. I'm not saying that this is going to it's not increase their income, but at least billions of dollars of government money in terms of subsidy Stop that it. was being wasted and going to the wrong people, brokers and bureaucracy and all those kind of people is now finished. So at least that is also helping directly to the people. But of course, I think skilling and education are really the key. All right. On that note, thank you all for joining us. I thank the panel as well for joining us on the discussion. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you so much.